welcome to this week's episode. I'm Paula Williams. I'm John Williams. And we are ABCI, and ABCI's mission is... Do what is necessary to help all you folks out there in the aviation world sell more of your products and services. Absolutely. Um, If you have followed ABCI for a number of years, which... Some folks have, actually. We've got a few um, clients and customers and, and, and friends and family and other people who know where we were 15 years 15 ago. Years ago. Uh, when we originally started ABCI, our intention was to do aviation copywriting. At the time, nobody knew what the heck that was. Exactly. And now it is starting to become a thing. In fact, um, in the last week, we've had two people contact us to do aviation copyright. Exactly. So and she just about fell over. I know. It's like, oh my gosh. Um, my very first experience on the job, you know, with this with this company that I thought we were going to build was finding out that everybody in aviation thought that copywriting had something to do with intellectual property and right. you know, like uh, the copyright at the bottom of a um, website or something like that, but this is copywriting with a W, right? <laughs> so writing copy for people's websites, brochures, um, marketing materials, email campaigns, and other things like that. So um, we're going to talk about three things that have changed in the world of aviation copywriting besides the fact that people actually know what aviation copywriting is nowadays, right? Uh-huh. Okay. And I think that's because a lot of people are coming in from other industries. I mean, I came here from the finance industry where everybody threw around the term like uh, normal, um, like it was a regular word, you know. Um, in aviation, I think we've, we're getting to the point where people are coming from other industries where copywriting is something that people buy and something that people expect to have as part of their marketing process, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Cool. So three things that have changed in the last few years, and we'll summarize this, and then we'll talk about each of them in a little bit more depth. So uh, keyword research to position your products um, using the classic marketing dilemma of demand versus supply. Number two, AI and outsourcing. And number three is SEO optimizing, right? Sounds kind of dry to me. I know. It's terrible. (laughs) um, Actually, it's pretty exciting because... (laughs) It used to be that researching supply versus demand was something that only the big companies could do. The Harley Davidsons of the world, the Wells Fargo's of the world, Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola's of the world. So if you go to a marketing class in, in a, at a university or whatever, they talk about market research and they talk about the Gartner Group and they talk about Forrester Research and the Nielsen ratings and other things like that to find out what people are actually doing and what they're buying and you know who they're polling for and all these other things. Um, it used to you used to have to do focus groups and, oh, and yes. research companies and and things like that, and you paid a ton of money for market research. You don't have to do that anymore, nope. or at least we smaller companies who don't have the means to do that now have a means to do that. Right, right, and it is using Google. Right, it's the biggest source of big data on the planet. Yep. So, and there are some other. Lesser sources that are still big data. Oh, yeah. And we all, as companies, you know, even the smallest company, the smallest mom and pop shop or, or solopreneur who is doing, um, just starting out as a broker, hanging out a shingle for the very first time, you can do this as easily as Wells Fargo, you know? Probably easier because of no bureaucracy. Right, exactly. So... Keyword research, you can find out um, using software. We use a piece of software called SEMrush, uh, but there are others, and some of them are free and some of them you pay money for. Um, If you're in our marketing lab, um, we do this for you. But what we look for is who is looking for what, and we do that with keywords. And the reason we use Google as our base is because 70% of all Internet traffic in the U.S. runs through Google. Right. And depending on the day, that can be as high as 80 or 90 percent, you know, for some topics and things like that. And some days it's as low as that. So you could do the same research on Bing and uh, Yahoo, Yahoo, whatever, 
but it will be less effective. Exactly. So, you know, you want to find out what are people searching for. There are tools that will help you do that nowadays. And you can find out, you know, for example, for our last episode, we were wondering whether we should use the term hybrid or whether we should use the word multi-channel. And so to figure out which title we should use for our video and our, our podcast episode, we went with hybrid because 10 people more a month are looking for hybrid versus multi-channel. Yeah, because the average Joe doesn't know what multi-channel means. Well, you know, whatever. It's you get to find out what what terms people are actually using when if they're if looking you've been for to business school. You know what multi-channel is, but the majority of people haven't been right. But what words are people actually using to look for your product or service? Right. Um, you get to find that out nowadays, and uh, you get to find out maybe if you have, let's say, you're a multi-service FBO and you've got several different. Um, products and services to offer, how do you figure out which of those are the most in demand? Which of those should you invest in an ad for? You find out who's looking for serious maintenance versus citation maintenance. In you know? your particular section of the country. In your particular section of the country. So you can narrow this down by state or by region or you know whatever you like and figure out what are the terms they're looking for and who's looking for you know, which ones are the most popular. In some cases, they even narrow down to the city. Right. And using some of the software that we have, you can also, so that's the, the demand side, right. right? So you figure out what people are looking for. The other side of that is the supply side. So you can figure out what are people paying for keywords. That's not the people searching, by the way. That's the people who are providing. Who are advertising. That are advertising. Right. right. So how many people are actually advertising <clears throat> for this product or service? And you can also, a lot of the software will give you a competition score to see how many people are providing um, services that include that keyword. And one of our researchers on, we were researching keywords a couple of years ago mm -hmm. to see what it costs people who are paying for these clicks. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember the search word, but at the time it was $2,600 per click. Yeah. That's crazy that right? somebody would pay for that. Right. Well, they better be able to convert every click if that's yeah, the case. No joke. So um, anyway, the, the point being supply and demand. You're looking for high demand and low supply. When you find those things, you jump on it. <laughs> you jump on it, you know, and that's where you invest your money in marketing. Yep. Right. Um, you don't want to invest in something that nobody's looking for. And you don't want to invest in something that everybody is advertising. Right. Uh, because in both cases, you're not going to get the same return on investment. No, you're not. OK. So as you're doing at, um, aviation copywriting, we start by doing keyword research. And that is why we want to look for um, how do we position your product? You know, what is the best way? What are people actually wanting when they're looking for? Your product because there's a lot of ways to express any particular product or service right. so um, one keyword research number two ai and outsourcing this is actually kind of cool um, <laughs> and kind of scary uh, if you are in the business of copywriting or if you feel that it is an art form and you know you're like me um you know spent many many years learning how to write um you're in for a surprise you're in for a surprise uh, there are a lot of sources that will do this less expensively than you would think. Of course, those sources have their limitations. Indeed. So um, our process when we do copywriting for someone is to do the outlining very, 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 very carefully, right? In a collaboration exercise. In a collaboration exercise, we make sure that we have got the audience and the purpose and the topics and everything else nailed down for each page of a website, as an example. Mm -hmm. And we do the subheads of that um, page and, and the topics and the, the general gist of where we're going. These aren't marketing people. What's a subhead? A subhead are the... Um, so you got a title on a page and then you have subtitles. So if you've ever read a newspaper, you usually, if you have a long article, there are usually some subheads Just saying. in that article. Um, so... We do that um, as the first step, and then we usually get the writing from several different sources, yes. one of which is AI. You'd we be use, surprised how good those can be. We use copysmith.io, which is pretty good. 
but it is not everything and it can be misfired. <laughs> Big time. <laughs> Big time. And it will give you crap uh, if you don't put in the right inputs. So um, it is an art form to use AI for copywriting yes. uh, that we're learning. And then uh, we usually use several different writers to also... Human writers. Human writers to also provide input on right. that topic. And then we take the best of those things, put right. it together and edit it into the best possible copy we can write. So that's thing number two is... AI and outsourcing. And that is always better than if you had one person sitting in a corner writing copy, right? And after all that's said and done, mm -hmm. I'm the last guy to look at it. Yep. And John does the final edit on everything. And if a mistake gets past me, then I'm the guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and me. Yeah. You know, and it has to pass the smell test and the suspicion test because John's a very suspicious customer, right? <laughs> Um, he is one of the hardest people to sell to because he knows marketing and he knows all the tricks and everything else. But if it can get past John and, you know, he would actually buy the product if you were in the market for it, then we know we've got a pretty good piece of copy. One would hope. Yeah. Okay. And then thing number three is SEO optimizing because it doesn't matter how good or compelling your copy is if nobody ever sees it. That's exactly correct. Right. <clears throat> and so we go back through and, you know, do things like the keyword density, uh, things like um, suggestions for alt tags, suggestions for image um, placement, suggestions for um, other related keywords and things like that that need to go in that copy to make sure that it is as well placed or as optimized as we can make it so that Google is more likely to rank it well, right? And we consult with Google from time to time. We do. Yep. With real people from real Google. Real people, right. <laughs> oh my gosh, I didn't know there were any real people at Google until uh, until some of our clients got big enough to actually warrant a, um, a Google representative who actually makes appointments and does tutorials and those kinds of things. Of course, Google puts out all of these... Um, educational resources that we take advantage of as well yeah. but uh it never you can't beat talking to a real human being right yeah and you since you're the rep for the uh for your client mm -hmm. then you're the person that talks to google mm -hmm. and it's really nice to be able to to talk to them in person so um so those are three things that have changed I would say, in the 15 years that we've been doing aviation copywriting the three things that have not changed right, are that it is harder than it looks to create great quality writing. Yes, it is. And then, even if it's great quality writing, mm -hmm. if the keyword placement and density isn't right, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Nobody will ever see it. That's right. So, mm -hmm. makes it very difficult to actually make it work. Right. And a lot of people treat this um, and this is number two, it's very important and shouldn't be treated as an afterthought. So a lot of people will use um, a website builder or hire a website designer that is maybe not an aviation um, uh, industry person, you know, insider. So they will build you a beautiful website. In a lot of cases, the design is fantastic, but the copy is ipsum lorem yeah whatever you know and they just leave it like that so then the company that just spent a lot of money on this fabulous website design is going to just assign somebody from their company you know a salesperson or whatever so you spent a lot of money on this design and it's got this um boilerplate copy in it so the company will just assign somebody you know a salesperson or somebody else to write some copy and think that it doesn't matter what they put in there because people are only there to look at the pretty pictures um, what we have found is that beautiful websites are a dime a dozen <laughs> or a quarter million dollars or a quarter of a million dollars you might pay a ton of money for a, a beautiful design we had a client that actually paid a quarter million dollars for a website and after six months or eight months, had not even one phone call from it. Exactly. So <clears throat> it doesn't matter how much you pay for the design. It doesn't matter how much you invest. Um, you do need to have something that looks good and that is efficient and that works well. Um, I will say that. But that's table stakes nowadays um, to have a beautiful website because it is so easy to do. Yes. Uh, what is not table stakes and what really makes the difference is compelling copy that 
makes people inspired to take the next step in your sales process and actually pick up the phone and call you or fill out a, a, a form or request a consultation or whatever the next step is in your sales process. Two things in this that are important that we gloss over. One is the headline itself and two is the editing. If mm -hmm. you've, <laughs> I saw yesterday or day before a thing about two countries that were considering reinstigating fights between their two <laughs> Resuming fights between two countries. <laughs> uh, but fight is a valid word, so spell check won't get the fact that it should have been flight. Right, exactly. So the editor, had it been copy edited, mm -hmm. would have caught that. Right. And even before that, you have to have the good bones. You have to have defined the audience and the purpose and your competitive advantage, and there has to be some substance there. It can't just be fluff right. and silliness, right? Exactly. Okay. So, also... You know, we, we glossed on over this, but visuals will get the attention, but the compelling writing is what really gets your prospect to take the next step. Yes, it is. So right. it can't be written at too high a grade level. Mm -hmm. It can't be long and laborious. Mm -hmm. It's got to be, you got to sell the next sentence with the one you're reading. Exactly. And it needs to be well positioned, well written, well edited, and well placed. Uh -huh. So all of those things are, are really important with aviation copywriting. So anyway, in a nutshell, those are the three things that have changed and the three things that have not changed right. in aviation copywriting. Yep. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next week. Stay happy and healthy. See you next time.